Hi everyone, and welcome to Elite Rugby SNC podcast. First off, if you haven't already, sign up and join Elite Rugby SNC today. We provide you with all your strength, conditioning, speed, and recovery needs. You can try before you buy, so try our seven day, seven dollar trial to get a taste of what we offer here at Elite Rugby SNC. Also, sign up to our newsletter and receive free bonus content each and every single week. So take your game to the next level, become a beast, and join Elite Rugby SNC today. So, good day, Ben. How are you? Yeah, happy Easter. Um, happy Easter. Very well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm going well, thanks. Happy Easter and happy Easter to everyone that's listening today as well. Excellent. So today we are going to be talking about how to stay how to stay a beast in the in season for rugby. So let's jump straight into it. So is the in season a time to maintain all strength, power, speed, and fitness gained over the preseason, or it is or is it a time to continue to improve? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think a lot of people actually do a lot of hard work in the preseason, and they um, they basically switch off a lot of their um, elements that they've worked on in season. It's probably a big mistake. You take a look at the length of a season. Um, you can't maintain things for that long if you just go in maintenance mode. You've actually got to be chipping away and trying to improve. Where it's slightly different from the preseason is you you're chipping away to get littler gains, but you're trying to be really consistent across that. And sometimes uh, in a certain number of weeks, you might go a week where you're not trying to get a gain, but that would be one in every five, four or five weeks. Really, you should be trying to improve all your physical elements because you think about it, you're, you're doing a lot less volume of training. So you've actually got opportunity to improve as long as you're... Um, very intelligent and you're making sure you're very consistent with your training inconsistency in the training is the problem where people don't improve as well mm, and totally. what are your thoughts Kieran? yeah I definitely agree i think coaches and players can just use the term maintenance or trying to maintain strength but just as you said the season is way too long um especially now club land and even just rep footy and super rugby, the club season is just so long. And especially if you're going to be playing international rugby for, for the super rugby players, it's, it's a long season. You don't get much off, so you can't afford to maintain. And I think maintenance is harmful to performance because you're just getting into a comfortable position and you're not striving to work on those things and improve your strength, speed and your rugby skills. So I would just say continue to improve throughout the in-season and just be yeah, be smart about your training, but yeah, continue to push the needle forward. Yeah, probably the question to ask, and particularly for coaches, is would you just be happy with maintaining your skills and your knowledge of rugby um, and your execution? You're not trying to improve them in the season? Mm. There's mm. no way. You'd have to be trying to do that. So physically, you should be trying to do the same, really. Yeah. You can't be trying to do one in one area and not the other. It, it, it wouldn't make sense. And it's not going to lead to success in your season. Yeah, totally agree. So going from the pre-season to the in-season, what should an in-season gym program look like for club rugby athletes? And then we can also talk about academy and super rugby as well. Yeah, so having a lot of experience in um, all those levels, Club rugby, uh, definitely making sure that you're going to the gym Monday and Wednesday. Um, if you can, Tuesday is a good day as well. So how I'd like to see it structured, and it'd be great for you to step in and you know make some changes there. Your Monday, you do a couple of, uh, basically you do some rehab exercises or prehab, single leg work, shoulder stability type of work before your session. But the main focus on that first session will be your strength. You might still do like a, a power exercise, but your power exercise might be more that force type of power. What I mean is something like a power clean um, squat jump, something a loaded type of power exercise where it's not velocity based, it's more force based power. Um, yeah, and all body strength. If you are going to go to the gym Tuesday, then you can actually lower that volume on your Monday, just make it your lower body day. Um, a lot of people will go, oh, I'm really sore on Monday. I shouldn't do train lower body at the end of the day you're trying to get your lower body strength session as far away from your game day as possible the best time is 48 hours part um after a game you've just got to get in the habit of doing that once you're in the habit of doing that you're fine um if you are going to the gym tuesday look at doing 
your upper body then, your main upper body session, that's not going to affect any of your rugby on that day. And that that's, can be just a 40 minute session. You do it in the morning or you can do it prior to going to um, your field session with your club. Wednesday would make it a, um, a power day, again, with some rehab exercises or prehab exercises on um, shoulders, calves, different areas that you really need to maintain some health in. Um, and on each day I'd do core, you'd just have a different focus, but core would be a huge focus, even in the in-season, you really need that. Um, and that Wednesday, it's really more velocity-based movements in there and maybe yeah, you know, top up areas of strength on rotator cuff work, that type of stuff, um, some glute work in there as well. Um, and if you, you're super keen, you know, you could hit the gym again on the Thursday and do your second upper body session if that's something that you need like you might be a, a light person that only weighs you know um, your low 80s your high 70s and you, you need a bit of size but most people won't need that extra gym session and particularly if you you are a person that holds a bit of size um, your thoughts Kieran how would you structure that what would you do different yeah so I think a really important key aspect of it from going from pre-season in season is maintaining that routine. So one thing I like to do for, for my previous club, at my previous club, but also the rugby athletes that I still work with now is the Monday and Wednesday, we're still training on those days. It's not like we're in the pre-season, our gym days were Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and then changing the days up completely. It's, it's the same days we're training from pre-season to in-season. I think you really got to maintain that. I don't, think you should be changing up the days the body likes routine and it likes to and it's just so much easier for the athletes to schedule their their training on the end season so going for that monday session i think it's more of that yeah that strength focus that that force output but we do have some power movements in there as well to get them explosive are focusing on some maybe a bit more of a warm-up, like a bit longer if, if you're a bit sore. So just, yep, if you're a bit sore, let's work on a few areas and a few more prehab just to really make sure that you're ready to go for that session. But yeah, we've got a couple of power movements, some strength movements and some good core movements, but I, I like to program the, the whole body on that day. So one area is not getting too sore, um, especially with our club training the next night, but we're doing enough stuff at a stimulus to get an adaptation as well on that tuesday it's it's up to you i normally let the tuesday just for field training you can do your upper body extras it's completely fine to do that but i would normally program that on the thursday but it, it, it's completely up to the athlete if they want to do it on tuesday and that best works for your schedule sweet do it on that day and you can do another one on thursday as well if you really want to but those upper body extra sessions, I'm really focusing on just 30, 40 minutes, nothing too long. It's just going to be bang for your buck. We're going to do some sets, but we're not going to overdo it or anything like that. And you're going to get in, get out. But yeah, be good in getting the bare minimum, but also getting some good adaptation in that, in that session as well. And then our Wednesday, just like you said, we want to really get powerful and let, let's be explosive. Let's get that velocity going and, and moving with some really maximal intent um but if it's a bit of a younger player so a Colts player maybe we do a similar session to what we did on the Monday with a bit of power some strength um, and some core stuff just to really build up their training age and and just make sure that they earn the right to to do those powerful movements but for my older athletes who've got a high training age that they're, they're doing a lot more power stuff on that Wednesday and like we said Thursday you can do another upper body extras but keeping it short and sharp Friday you can do some active recovery or if you really wanted to you could do a priming session on that day if you want if you just want to get out of the get out of work or get out of the house and just do something very light or you can just save that to game day and do that as well so yeah that would be my my thoughts around training and structuring for the in season during a typical week yeah yeah brilliant uh probably one thing we should uh touch on that we've both um sort of excluded was those that are pretty experienced, you know, maybe a primer on that Saturday, that short little primer um, that we've uh, talked about in our uh, previous podcast and sent out some information. Um, and that's something you should experiment with, as we said, in your uh, trial game. So if you haven't done that, yeah, just be a bit cautious adding that. Yeah. yeah. And go back and listen to that episode. Episode 16, Context is Key. It was a great episode. Yeah. So... 
The same question now, but for the field training. So going from pre-season to in-season, what should an in-season field training look like for club rugby athletes and also the academy and super rugby players? Yeah, we probably, we might stick to the club. We probably didn't answer that question too much with the academy and super rugby. We maybe we'll expand on that next mm-hmm. time to more levels. Yeah, um, just thinking because we didn't do that with the strength. Um, well, it's interesting. Tuesday should be your biggest day in terms of volume. Okay. So you've got a little bit more volume on that day. So that's probably going to be your best training session of your week in terms of um, your, your biggest amount of con- content. So I'd like to have a really good warm up um, that leads into some stimulation on speed um, and change of direction type work. Um, and if it's a really good warm up, that's when at the back end of that, you can do a bit of, uh, depending on the groups, max velocity for those that need it. Um, if you feel that they, you're getting, you're in a colder environment, you might want to wait a little bit longer into the training session before you do that. Um, you're going to have obviously your, your units, your rugby component and some top up fitness on that night as well. So um, you, you're, because club training, and I'm going to be brutally honest because I've spent a lot of time there, traditionally the volume and intensity is pretty low. Like a lot of club training sessions are actually lower than games. Like they're, you know, that's just the nature of those settings. So if you want to be good in games, you've got to try and improve the intensity of that. And some clubs, um, that's hard to do. So that's where you make the decision if your club's not providing it to you to do some top-up conditioning there. And yet that can be based on what you need. You feel you're in a game. If you're not getting off the ground quick, you can be doing some Malcolm works. If your repeat efforts are poor, that's when you can be doing some MAS that's, you know, maybe 10 seconds on, 10 seconds on off um, for a few minutes and do a few, two to three sets of that type of work. So that'll be individual based on you. But I'd like to see that one, you know, that's probably going to be a 90 minute session in most club land. Mm. So you fast forward to your Thursday. Um, you really want to maintain, this should be your greatest intensity. So the speed of everything should be the quickest on that when you're actually in your rugby component. Um, but you just want a little less volume towards that. So that's where you might aim it for, you know, 60 to 70 um, to 75 minute session. So most clubs, you're probably still going to hit the 90 minute mark because there's just so much in rugby to work on. But if you can make sure that you're, rugby component is very very fast um, with longer rests if you need it but just in the intensity of the skill work and the rugby aspect should be very very quick you can have extra rest in between to minimize that fatigue effect because you should have worked on that volume a little bit earlier in the week Um, and that's that's basically how i'd structure it if you're only training two nights a week and some, that's most clubs, I think. Some clubs train a little bit more if they're the more ambitious ones, but we'll, we probably won't go into that at the moment unless you want to. What's your views, Kieran? How, what would you do differently? Yeah, so I would pretty much very, very similar. So always want to make sure we got some good warm-ups going on the Tuesday and Thursday. I'd like to see for our sort of max velocity stuff, yeah, we're, we're going to be sprinting over those longer distances. So looking at maybe like 40, building up to possibly even 60 for those outside back. So I, I like to see those longer sprints done a bit earlier in the week. And then on a Thursday, we're going to do those short, sharper um, type sprints. On the conditioning on the Thursday, it'll probably be similar, maybe a bit longer distance. And when I say long distance, I don't mean like running 100 metres or 200 metres. I mean like we're targeting around like say 40 to 60 metres again on that Maz Um, that 10 seconds on 10 seconds off or some sort of shuttle weather going out to say 25 or 30 meters up and back getting off the deck as well so i I like to see those longer efforts done on the tuesday whereas on the thursday we can build down to those five seconds on 15 seconds off or 25 seconds off Um, it's just short and sharp getting that high intensity and we're really exploding off the mark as well so i like to do those shorter efforts on those days in terms of like conditioning, small sided games and conditioning games, it really depends if you want to bring that over to the in season because some of those rugby drills, the coaches already might get them doing that. 
if they're doing say three on fives or something or four on sixes on attack and defense if they're already doing that you probably don't need to double up on that so you might just stick to your mas running um shuttles and malcolms and all that or some sort of tempo run if you really want to do that but i really a uh, this one, this tips for the coaches, for the SNC coaches out there, really make sure that you're paying attention to the to the, the training. Because if you're yep. prescribing something, say a small side of game, but they've already done two drills that mimic that small side of games, you probably don't need to do that. Or if they're doing a drill that's they're doing some really good sprint work, um, high intensity efforts, and getting a lot of volume down, you're like, oh, maybe I need to adjust my set because I had them doing 10 reps of a MAS run, maybe I just need to do five reps and then have a minute's rest and then do another three reps or something like that. So yeah, really pay attention um, SNC coaches out there to what the other coaches are doing because it does change a lot. Coaches love to add in and take away drills. So um, that might affect your drill and you don't want to pre prescribe something that they've already done during the session. And, or if you get angry at them because like, come on, like you've got to be doing this. We, we need to be doing this. And you're like, well, it's probably not appropriate at the time. So yeah, just make sure that you're paying attention to the, what you're doing at training and they could have already done enough and you probably don't need to do anything. You could do some sort of game just to change it up and play some offside touch, which I've done in the past. I was going to program some MAS writing. I was like, well, they've already done a lot. Maybe we just play some offside touch and have a bit of fun with it and change it up so yeah that would be uh my thoughts on that yeah that's really interesting i've probably um it, because club you know last time i was doing that was 2014 and uh, the coaches involved were pretty good there or well, super rugby coaches now um so everything was planned we'd have session plans coming out everything was discussed and organized and that's the environment i'm used to and it's a really good tip because most a lot of clubs don't operate that that way. Um, so, yeah, critically analysing what's going on and how you can benefit or complement. I used to see strength and conditioning, particularly in club land, and is a shock absorber. All right, this is performance here coming across. Right, do I need to ramp up what I'm doing to get us there, or the coaches are doing so much? Do I have to lower down? So you're operating your strength and conditioning like this so that that performance is there because at the end of the day coaches will do what they comfortable and what they need to do your program should be the shock absorber that makes sure things are running smooth on top mm. so that's a way to take a look at it and that's what you're explaining there so that's really good yeah totally and for the athletes that and clubs that don't have an snc coach we're going to talk our program up here right now the become a beast program we we make sure that during the in season you're still doing your, your run tech movements you're still doing your, your sprints and then also got that conditioning option in there just if you feel like your club training didn't give you enough we got some top-up stuff to make sure that you're ticking that box and being able to maximize your performance during the week so that you can do that out on the field on game day yep absolutely so to summarize the gym and field during the week so our Monday session, we're doing our first gym session. Tuesday, we're doing our Correct. first field session, which you also have the option to do some upper body extras, looking at around maybe that 30, 40 minutes at maximize, like maximum in the gym. Wednesday, we're looking at gym number two, and depending your age and all that, but it's going to be more sort of velocity-based and some power and really shift and some tin. Thursday can, is our field training number two. And again, another option for some upper body extras. Friday, looking at some active recovery, or if you really want to, you can do sort of like a priming session that we have put up on YouTube. You could do something similar to that as well on the Friday, or you can save that and then do that on the Saturday as well. And then Sunday, making sure that you're doing some good active recovery. Anything you want to add on to that, Ben? Yeah, I think it's really important that we start talking about the language of um, how we look at it. So um, when you're programming um, what you do from a rugby point of view in terms of rugby coaching and strength and conditioning, we have game day is our key. Okay, So everything that happens pre and post that has a number. So we'll work from a game day. You've got a game day out for the rest of your next week. So you've got it. That's called game day. So your next day is game day plus one. So what would you do on a game day plus one? That's very much an active recovery. Very, very important that you do that. 
So your game day plus two, look, sometimes it's 48 hours or slightly less before your training. Um, that's going to be your main strength session for your week. So if, you know, if you're pulling up a little bit sore and stuff, have you done your recovery well on your, um, you know, what you've done after your game or your game day? Or do you actually need to add some more AM recovery prior to your gym session? So that's the way you want. Just say you play on a really muddy ground and it smashes mm. your legs, right? You know you're probably going to need some extra recovery. So you've got to get in the habit of game day plus two. That's the opportunity time on a seven-day turnaround to get your max strength done. So that the DOMs that you feel, particularly on your Wednesday, are pretty much gone for, by Thursday, non-existent by Friday, really, in a way. Um, so that you're ready to go on Saturday. So game day plus three is your main field session, your heaviest field session. So you can already see that game day plus two and game day plus three, we're really front loading. the Most of your volume of your week is getting done there. That's your biggest volume component. Okay, so you've only got really a day post your rugby to get recover yourself well enough to handle your volume of your training week. That's how important that recovery is. Wednesday, velocity based on you. Um, and this is where we start shifting it to game day minus three. Then uh, your Thursday is game day minus two, and then game day minus one. So start thinking rather than just days of the week, what is this training session in relation to game day? Awesome. And that's a, it's a really good point for our coaches out there, but also for our athletes to, to understand what your coach is saying when they say game day minus three or game day plus two as well so definitely some good terminology and we will be looking to provide some bonus free content on that as well so keep an eye out for our newsletter or sign up to our newsletter via the link in our description as well great so. bit of advertising there <laughs> like it <laughs> so now we're going to move on to some frequently asked questions during the in season so for for specific movements that cause some high stress and, re and require longer recovery time, such as some Nordics or RDLs, when should athletes be performing these movements during the week? Yeah, this is really, really, really good. Um, and we've touched on it, game day plus two. Uh, that's um, our biggest strength component. That's where we're going to get a lot of those movements done in club land. Very different story for some of those exercises, say in a elite environment, because some of the eccentric, we might actually say for game day plus three, post our second field session of the day, we might add them in there so that they're not taking anything away from the field session. Because at the end of the day, strength and conditioning is there to support your rugby. Okay, you have to be really good at rugby. It's um, something that assists your rugby. And being really a good strength and power athlete that's un uncoordinated and can't play rugby doesn't make you a good rugby player. So going back to that point, sorry to put that in there, but that uh, game day plus two would be that time. Okay, so we're trying to get that doms further away from what you're doing. And it also allows, say, you 24 hours from that session before your field session. That's a pretty good recovery time if you look after yourself and refuel. Um, and it gets some of that more lengthening and strengthening that has a bit of tissue breakdown on purpose so that you have to adapt done earlier so that you are recovered and have that adaption for later in the week. What's your yep. views on that, Kieran, or how would you organise that? Yeah, totally. If I'm trying to program to let's say stay for the for the hamstrings as it's quite easy to answer say an rdl and a, and a nordic if you if you're really trying to do both of them during the week if you're a coach like that play uh, structuring them maybe on a wednesday a monday or a wednesday is a lot better than just doing all of it on a when on a monday or doing all of it on a wednesday so i think making sure that you're I've got a few, a couple of days or enough time between those two exercises, not just putting it all on one day and they're feeling really, really sore for their Tuesday session. So the game day plus two, like if they're pulling out really sore before that session started, then they probably can't reach the speeds that you want them to reach as well. So if you're going to be doing some high eccentric focus stuff, making sure you're doing it early in the week, or like you said, after that Tuesday session, you can do Nordic quite easily after the session, you just need two people, one person to hold your ankles and the other person performing the movements. Or if you've got the luxury of having the gym at your training ground, 
sweet jump in there and you can do a, a couple sets of rdls especially for those players who haven't showed up to the monday gym session or just can't or they're, they're doing their own gym program but you know that they're not doing those key movements that make strong and robust muscles then get them in the gym afterwards you can do the same thing for some core work if they haven't done their core work on monday get them in the gym after the tuesday session or even prior to the session as well if you really wanted to and getting them ticking those boxes as well so yeah i'm, I'm making sure that if i'm doing an eccentric movement i'm going to do at least one of them on a monday and if i really need to do something i'll do it on a wednesday but it won't be near the same in volume as like volume and reps and sets compared to the monday because i know that that game day is coming up really quick and i don't want them to be too sore on a friday and if, if, if they don't recover well then they probably won't feel the best for the saturday so yeah it's just making sure that i plan it correctly not too much volume and knowing if my player is coming to training or not. And if they're not, then we're doing some something on the Tuesday and Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. It's something I'd probably add to that is if you're doing some, something that requires some eccentric work or like you we will just stick with the hamstrings here for a bit. I do that on the Monday, on the Wednesday, when you're doing your velocity based gym stuff, um, that's when I do some isometric work, single mm. leg isometric, like whether it's a single leg um, wide ankle hip thrust or um, something like a Bosch hamstring work. I do something isometric on that day because there's very little DOMS involved with that yep. on that day. So that way um, I'd be a bit reluctant to do two eccentric things or high eccentric loading exercises in a hammy within a week. I would space them with one um, like an eccentric day that can be double leg, then you've got a single leg isometric, uh, isometric focused hamstring work or glute posterior chain work on that one. So that's how I'd separate those to go into a little bit more nuance on that. Yeah, totally. And those isometrics are great exercises. Um, yeah, definitely recommend it. And we have posted them on our Instagram page if you want to go visit them. So now we're moving on to- I do them over eccentric. <laughs> yeah, totally. We know that. So now, now we're moving on to the bye week and we're sort of split it into two questions, but they are very similar in nature. So what should athletes do during a bye week and what should coaches do during the bye week as well in terms of structuring programs? Should they reduce the volume, increase the volume? Should we do more off feet conditioning or should we do a higher load? Well, what I might get you to do before I whack in my thoughts, what part of the season are these bye weeks are they early mm. are they the midpoint how many games have i played so sort of go through your views on each mm. one of those yeah it's a good it's a good counter question maybe i asked you this before we uh jumped on here um so if you got to buy so typically down in the canberra competition the john Aden cup um not as many teams compared to other comps so there is a couple early buys. So you might play two games or you might play one game and then you got to buy. And it's like, well, you don't really want to have an easier week that week. So we're going to make sure that we keep the volume quite high or, or similar to the previous week and possibly do something on that Saturday as well, making sure that we're getting, say, training a bit earlier in the morning or around lunchtime and getting some good a good team run, some good conditioning, some good skills and maybe some scrums and lineouts. And then you can go watch um, the other teams play as well. So if it's early in the week, yeah, we're not, we're not having the week off. We're, we're, we're definitely training and um, pushing the needle forward. But if it's more towards halfway through the season, that's where you really got to think about, okay, did they just come off a really hard game or they're feeling a bit fresh? Maybe we take the Tuesday a bit easier, focus on some individual skill areas that we're, we're lacking as a team, but also individually. And then maybe on the Thursday, we're going, we're, we're building that volume up again. And then the Saturday, do we do some off feet, like change it up completely? Maybe the team's a bit fried. Maybe we just go into the gym and, and do like a, a circuit based training just because we, we know technically, and skill-wise, we're really good. It's just we just need a bit of a break from rugby as well. You might have that option or you might, again, train on the Saturday, do a really good team run, some maybe reduced volume, but some really high intensity, and then you can go watch the other teams play. Um, so, yeah, you really got to 
pick the bye week and make sure that you know how the team's going in terms of their position on the ladder, how they're feeling as a team, as like cohesion and environment. And yeah, to sort of go from there. What's your thoughts, yep. Ben? Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Like if you're early on in the season, like you've had a good preseason, all of that type of stuff, um, you're still getting used to actually being in in season. So I'd yeah, you'd still train Tuesday, Thursday, and do something Saturday. Like if anything up to say four weeks in, you've only had three games. Yeah, that's fine. Once you go past say four games in a row, you can slightly change things. So let's say we've had those four games in a row, like a little principle that might work. I still want to at least get two training sessions in. So if your guys are absolutely beat up, they're sore, okay, cool. We'll change our training to Tuesday and Thursday. Um, uh, uh, sorry, Thursday and Saturday. What we can do Tuesday, get all the players in. Okay, you might do a pool session. You still want to get them around. Uh, they just say if they need extra treatment and that type of stuff, we get that done. If they're just fried, right, you might just go, let's not even bother doing something on that Tuesday. Let's cruise. So um, I'd always still want two, two field sessions in that week. Okay. One can be higher intensity, one can be lower. Because you can't go from where you have complete time off in that bye week. That's when you're going to suffer going into that a full training week the next week. And the week after or the week after that, that's when you start paying um, paying prices for that really low training. Um, like you said, some of those, maybe even with those two field sessions, like you might do your normal team run and stuff, there's no reason why you couldn't go over to a local gym and go, okay, we've got 20 minutes offbeat conditioning as part of that. Mm. You, you can add to it. But you still want to maintain some volume and um, some skills and so forth. Also, the other thing in that period of time, what, what's a really good time off rugby is, okay, we've just got a really low contact in that bye week. Um, if we do any contact, it's really on pads in a controlled environment, just purely for timing, so we don't lose mm. timing. So if you drop a training session, um, maybe go to off um, off the conditioning and you do some really controlled contact on pads, people could pop out of that bye week feeling really good. And that's mm. what you want to do. It's not a chance to go backwards. It's just a chance to freshen up and get rid of little niggles and mix up your environment and your um, your predictability of, you know, oh, we go to training Tuesday, Thursday, but you just want to add some variety, like you were saying. Mm. And I think an another point that just popped in my head is is during that bye week, if, if you're not going to be training on that Tuesday, may maybe look to have a team dinner and revisit some of the goals that you talked about during the, the preseason. I've seen it in, in rugby clubs before where they've done the bit, the team building and goal setting during the preseason, but they've never revisited the goals during the in-season. So like make sure you're revisiting those, those goal planning sessions to see if you're on target and what are some other things that players can work on. And then you can just have play discussions where the coaches are out of the room and the players are talking to each other and making sure that everyone's accountable. And if, you, if you're going to do something like that, you could also – Go do some bowling. Go go do something else that is not rugby related. And it's just something fun. Maybe laser tag, but don't run around, you know, cause too much stress. So just, just something completely different where it just takes your mind off rugby. You're, you're doing some really good team building. And it's, yeah, it's, it's building, building some really good cohesion between the players. Yeah. Something I wanted to jump in about the bowling. Um did that a couple of times with a team in Japan and uh, I came last twice and uh, I, I copped it. Copped Damn. it. I just, yeah, <laughs> I yeah, couldn't handle the pressure. It got to me and, yeah, so, you know, I just thought I'd let you know that. I'm yeah, bowling. so if, if you're the coach picking the, the, the event or sport that you're going to go do for fun, make sure you're good at it or get some practice in so you don't come last and, and look bad in front of your, your team. Yeah, I'm going to pick bowling so they can give me shit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, that, yeah, part two of the, the bye week question, which we sort of already touched upon, but it's good to re-emphasize. So athletes do run the risk of a spike in training if they don't do much during that bye week to the, to the next week afterwards. What can athletes do to prevent some risks if, that, say, the coaches have decided we're not training that week or they know typically 
in, in the history of the club, they don't really train that hard during that bye week. What, what are some things some athletes can do to bro- just, yeah, prevent that injury and that spike for next week? Well, you'd probably uh, buy the Become a Beast program and you'd follow the training in there. But um, no, seriously, what you would do is, look, it's cool. Maybe Tuesday you go, I'm going to go do a pool recovery session. Okay, that's fine. And on your Thursday and your um, Saturday, uh, do some really good warm up and some run tech type work. Okay. Uh, still do some skills like catch pass with a mate. Um, and then some just really top up conditioning, like three to four minutes, three to four, um, three sets would be fine. So, a total of you know, anywhere from 12 to 15 minutes. a really good topping up conditioning. Um, I'd do that twice. And that, that will look after you. Like you're keeping your calves conditioned well, your hip flexors, your hamstrings for running. Um, you're still keeping your timing of your skills. You're not feeling slow and lethargic. Um, and also keep up your strength training as well. You might shift your strength training to go, okay, cool. I'll, I'll go to the gym on, uh, I'm going to have Monday off. So I'll have a double recovery. I might do Sunday and Monday as recovery. I'll go to the gym on uh, the, the Wednesday um, and I might do something the Friday, like the power stuff. And then you've just shifted your training week a little bit, allowed some for recovery. You've kept some of the intensity in that area, but you just haven't had huge amounts of volume. Like you've got to keep some form of intensity there. How you feel fresh after that is just not that you're not doing as much volume, really. Mm. Um, and if you're, you're in a specialized position, you might want to pack some one-on-one scrums with some people. You might want to pack against a scrum sled. You might actually need to keep that strength in that area so it's not a big shock going into a Tuesday scrum practice and playing on the weekend and then you get sore. You, you, as you would know, sometimes a week off, you feel really sore coming back into the normal stuff if you haven't done things. And mm. that can send you backwards. And that's that's what you're trying to minimise that risk in terms of a training spot is an understimulation I'd rather than a training spot it's you've had an understimulation that's led to you uh, going backwards in your ability to handle load totally and I think you've you've answered that really well and the other thing I'd add to it is if you're at a club where say the threes and fourth grade cult second and first grade have different schedules and there's not enough teams in one comp compared to the other so let's say you're in second grade and you have a buy that week, but threes and fours have a game. Even if you don't put your hand up to go play down in that threes um, team, you could you could go train with them, do the skills and do the conditioning if they do any conditioning down in three and threes and fours. But doing those those shorter sharp ses- sessions, doing those scrums and lineouts, that that could be a, a great option for you if your team isn't training that day and you can go train of them for a little bit as well. That's something I have seen in the past um, as well with yeah, the different schedules. So that, that could be an option for you. Yeah. Being really good club and doing that too, you're actually mm. helping your, your teammates or your club mates prepare for their game. I think that's fantastic. But, mm. And that adds to the, uh, a wonderful club environment where, you know, no one's bigger than the team below them and they're happy yep. to help out. I mean, yeah, it's a really totally. good point. So what should athletes be doing post-game to best recover and what should athletes be doing on a Sunday after the game? Yeah. So, look, rugby is a great game and it's full of, um, you know, the third half is usually the hard half, the social side of things too. Um, but make sure you hydrate, treat any of your injuries immediately, Get some really good nutrition into you. Um, but look, have some social time with some friends. Just be sensible about it as well. Like sometimes like you've got a celebration you're going to go to, all of that. But I'm not saying to be a boring nerd in a way where you don't do anything. But if you are a boring nerd, fantastic. You're going to train well the next week. Uh, it might be, mate, you're going to have a couple of years. Have it one water in between each beer. Right, just make sure that you go home that night and get a good eight hours sleep um, on that next day. Make sure you do some recovery and have some social recovery. I mean, going and seeing friends, family, having some downtime, switching your mind off um, anything as well, watching a movie later in the, the afternoon or the evening and just being really mindful that uh, your body's been through a lot 
and it love that you did that. You've just got to give it some good quality nutrition, recovery and hydration and some rest so that you can attack the next training week. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I totally agree. And I think after games, no matter what grade you are playing, you got to make sure you get some food in. So let's say for first grade, a lot of them have after match functions and that could be an hour or an hour and a half between eating. And I have seen that. So if you don't have any food afterwards or, or available or even just some, some chalky milk or something like that, like you really got to make sure you like pack some snacks so you can eat, then go over to the function because sometimes the food comes out a bit late and you're just starving. Like it's, it's best to get that food in there straight away. But so yeah, make sure you got that. If you're playing second grade and having to back up for first grade, make sure you got a couple snacks um, in between yep. those those games and again you need you need something straight after first grade Colts who can be there all day playing coming there just before lunchtime make sure you have a really good breakfast and and having those snacks and then having some good food after the game and, and making making sure that you're staying well hydrated because you could potentially play another two games if you're playing second grade and then get caught up to first grade as well the next day have a good sleep in get out, go for a couple of walks, socialize with some friends and family, or just go for a light bike ride or jump in the pool or just, just do something. Just sitting there dead on the couch probably isn't the best thing to do all day. Get out and move a little bit, do some stretching and, and rolling as well. Um, and just find out what best works for you. If you like doing a certain routine, stick to it. If you want to change it up, change your routine up. But yeah, those the hydration and nutrition plays a massive role and, and just make sure you're do, doing something on the Sunday and not just being a couch potato all day. Yep, absolutely. I think that's fantastic. So the next question, I pulled up extremely sore from the weekend's game and not feeling my best for my Monday gym session. What should I do? Should I train or rest? Well, great question. Uh, this is a reflection and this happens even at the elite level. That is your opportune time to train. So there's a couple of things you can do about this. Um, if you decide that you normally like training in the morning, postpone that until the afternoon. If you, you pull up really sore when you wake up, you know when you wake up that you feel sore. Add some more recovery. Does that mean you can have hot colds, you have a cold bath, you do something like that in your AM, or you, you're short on time, you do that at lunchtime. Okay, you find some time to do some extra recovery or something, even if stretching, rolling out. When you go to that session, you're going to train, okay? What you might do is you have a good chat to your strength and conditioning coach, or you make the decision. If you, you're a person that's doing five sets on exercises, you might do four. If you're a person that's doing four sets, you might do three. So I'd say slightly manipulate the volume of what you're doing uh, rather than avoiding. A lot of the time, if you have it, a really good warm up, and once you get into it, you actually feel good. Okay, mm -hmm. you could if we only ever trained when we feel really good. Like I think I trained three or four times a year. Like um, sometimes you, your body's messages and what how you are it's slightly different. The other thing, what you do after that training session, add more recovery. Like you go home and do proper recovery that night and Tuesday night. Um, if guys would pull up, say we'd do a gym aware jump test within the Olympic bar. And if they weren't within 90% of their maximum jump, this is how we'd make sure that they'd actually pull up better for games. You do 10 minute ice bath three times a week after each, um, the beginning part of the week. And you'd add an extra hour sleep to then just say you're used to eight, you try and get nine for those two and three nights. All of a sudden, we've added three hours extra sleep, right? And that's made a massive difference in your recovery. So there are things that you can do so that you can still train well. Yeah. Do the session. Talk to your coach. If you're not feeling the best, change the session up. If you don't have a coach and you're doing our program instead, do what you think is best um, in terms of changing that session if you need to. But just like you said, after the warm-up, 
you, you're going to be feeling a lot better than you were. And you might say, yep, sweet, I'm doing the session. Or if you're still not feeling the best after that, that warm up, just change it a, a couple things, but don't change the whole session completely and just go jump on the bike. You're not going to get any, any benefits from that. Like do the session because you're going to feel good. And who knows what happens if once you've gotten that good night's sleep later that night and the next two nights, back end of the week, you're feeling ready. Like, I'm really glad I got that gym session in because if I didn't, I don't think I would be in the position I am now on a Thursday or Friday to play um, my best rug rugby on that Saturday. Yep, great. Totally agree. So final question until, until we get onto our fan questions. Um, should exercise depth change over the in-season? So for our squat and bench and deadlift, should we be changing that so it's a really small um range of motion but more more weight on the bar or should we be continuing to maintain the, the range of motion that we've been training in during the preseason? um no we should definitely maintain that range of motion that we've got in that strength area you think we're trying to improve and, and you think um a squat to slightly a parallel whatever your squat dampen is a bench press or a deadlift they're not full displays of range of motion in those movement patterns anyway, are they? They're actually limited in a safe way for something you to perform. So they're not improving uh, your range of motion. What they're doing is maintaining strength through a range of motion, not the full, that range of motion that you're doing. Um, it's really interesting. I've, I've never heard of this. We would never do it because just say, um, I'll give you an example. I, Therefore, if I'm going to someone squatting um, and I want them to quarter squat um, and the forwards coach comes over and goes, uh, they're no good in, they're not strong in that beginning part of a motion of a squat anymore, um, scrum anymore. Oh, yeah, I've just been doing uh, partial squats. Yeah, thanks, mate. That's really, really good. You've just limited the strength in a range of motion for my players. Mm. So no, that would be defeating the purpose of those exercises. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Have you heard of people doing this or recommending this? Yeah, I've seen, seen it a, a bit um, the last few weeks for in-season training as most of the team sports and rugby, rugby league, AFL are into the in-season. So I've seen some coaches post that and have seen some research around it in the, the partial squats as well. You can decrease the range, increase the weight on the bar um and they've, they've shown some good results with that but i i totally agree you still want to be doing the range that they're going to be doing on the game you can change it up a little bit but yeah i, I wouldn't just be going straight from pre-season to in-season straight into our partial squats for the next eight ten weeks and then just like you said the performance from let's say a prop in their scrummaging because they can't achieve that full range is actually decreasing and then they the next person below them gets the selection above them because their performance has been decreasing because that's the area scrums is the area that they need to maximize and if they're not doing the best job they can their performance out in the field is going to suffer so you need to make sure your gym program is providing them with the the best possible outcome on the field as well yeah probably going back to that prop point if someone's um you know can't hold that 90 degrees coming out uh they're going to i've I can only feel strong if I extend myself. Their bodies in front of them, they collapse scrums a lot. Mm. That is not, yeah, that is not a very good outcome. Yeah. Think of rugby. If you've got to get down low to make a clean out or a breakdown, still maintain your feet, clean out, and then get on your feet. If you've only got strength in the top of most, when you go over, you're probably going to fall over a lot. Mm. So I would say it's a limited view on keeping your strength numbers up so to speak, inverted commas, but you're not improving performance in a way. Yeah, look, it may, just because the research says you get great numbers doesn't mean you're getting a great performance result from that. So be yeah. very cautious on doing that. Yeah. yeah. And again, we talked about this really well in uh, episode 16, Context is Key. That's twice now I've mentioned that episode. So if I mention it twice, you, you definitely got to go back and listen to it now. Yeah. We should have put that near coffee cups so people have to put it in like sugar or something. <laughs> it's cool. So we got two fan questions. So remember, if you have a burning question that you want Ben and I to answer, reach out on Instagram. Um, we do post that on our Instagram story 
questions but if we don't do it doesn't mean you can't send us through a message saying this answer uh, this question and for us to answer so we got jason norman who is uh my cousin from the other side of the family so ben's my cousin from the the, uh, the other side so shoulder injuries are common in rugby how can athletes best prepare themselves to minimize the injury and maximize performance so jason does get a bit injured so that's the, the reason he's asking the question yeah so um, if you look, most shoulder um, problems come from tackles. Right? Most of it is a technique-based problem where people stick out their arm in a reacting to a tackle. So the number one thing you can do is actually have really good technique in your collisions, so for your tackle and your clean-out. The second one is having a really good balanced shoulder program. So you're making sure your push-pull uh, ratio is really good. A lot of people you know, do a lot more push because bench press and overhead press looks really cool. Uh, making sure you're doing a lot more rowing type of work. Also doing a lot of um, scap setting activities for all your um, warm-ups for your upper body and external rotation work. Um, and also making sure that you're maintaining your strength. If you get a niggle from a bench press, do a dumbbell bench press. If you're still getting that, um, do floor press. If you're still getting a niggle, have a heavy weight in your good arm and a lighter weight in your, your arm that you're struggling with a little bit and build up that strength over time. Not doing anything is probably worse than doing something. Yeah. So yeah, have someone look at your technique, why your shoulder keeps getting sore, have someone uh, examine you in terms of the way it moves and just have a really good gym program. To give you an idea, back in say 96 when professional, I'm going back a while, when professional uh, rugby went professional, there was a super rugby team over two years that lost, had out of the 32 players in their squad, they had 16 shoulder reconstructions, right? So, and that was the norm from going, so that's when they just followed strength and conditioning programs from textbooks. Wow. One of it, just doing, you know, you bench press, you do this, do the chin ups. So what they had to do is go through and take a look through a whole lot of um, sports where you know your shoulder damage a lot. You're throwing sports like baseball, um, your overhead sports um, such as swimming and that type of stuff. And then they did started developing a whole lot of stability work exercises. So it's your um, shoulder integrity based exercises are just as important as your big bang um, prime moving exercises. And since then, it's pretty rare. I really can't remember in probably the academy in um, the professional setting over the last four five years i think i've seen one shoulder reconstruction so and that's multiple seasons multiple teams so it's very different now so that's where a good strength and conditioning program really does help and that's why you can't follow things like powerlifting. you can't follow things like um, bodybuilding and you can't follow do things like crossfit they're just not going to provide the shoulder balance that you need for a contact sport. So hopefully answer that well. What's um, some thoughts? Of, hopefully I've left some room for you there. No, you haven't. I'm not going to touch that answer anyway. It was perfect. I like it. So moving on to our next uh, final fan question. So remember, send your fan questions in. Uh, Luke Wallen. So when making the transition between pre-season and in-season, should we be tapering? Should there be a tapering phase or just switching methods and exercises going straight into that in-season? Yeah, we'll both answer this question. Um, it, it's not really a ta tapering. It's a transition of workload distribution. Okay. So in your pre-season, you, you've got high volume across the you know across the week and you might be doing things a couple of times so what we're doing now is we're targeting our so that on our game day we're ready to go so then we're just transitioning our activity sensibly to what we do on game day plus one plus two plus three minus three minus two minus one so it's the distribution of our load it does feel like tapering in a way, but what it is is it's just a more sensible distribution of LA so that we're ready to go on game day. So mm. yeah, some things, the volume does lower, but the intensity is the same and actually gradually going up in some areas. But we're managing the volume to come down and sensibly distributing that across the week. Yeah. 
totally agree. I think the only thing changes from my programming in the past was maybe taking one or two exercises out from a training session. So if we had a tri set of say core and a bit of shoulder work at the end, I would just take one of them out or I'm allowing, I'm not supersetting maybe a barbell back squat or a trap bar deadlift. I'm just keeping it as a, as a one exercise by itself and making sure that you're taking that two minutes rest or something along those lines with that exercise. So I'm not really changing too much. It's still the same sessions throughout the week and the same days being programmed. It's just allowing a bit more rest and taking out one to two exercises to make sure that we're getting our best bang for the buck and having plenty of rest as well. Yeah, that's a great answer. That probably gives the the context to lowering the volume but keeping the intensity, taking mm. a set out or not supersetting. So you some areas. So uh, yeah, that's really yeah. really good way of explaining it. So to summarize what we've just talked about, you need to continue to show up to the gym and your field training. You need to keep that routine. Routine doesn't change. You need to show up and do the work. You need to continue to improve throughout the in-season and avoid that maintenance. We need to keep building our speed, strength, power, and our rugby skills because that's what's going to make us a better athlete. Use your bye weeks to your advantage. So decide what's best for you. If it's an early bye, maybe you keep training, keep that volume intensity up. If it's a later bye halfway through the season, you might need to visit one of the options that we just talked about in, the, in this episode. If you have any niggles or concerns, you need to sort them out as soon as possible. If you need more advice on that, go back to episode 17 where we talked with uh, Megan Dennis because you don't want to turn a niggle into missing multiple games. Is there anything else you want to add on to that, Ben? No, I think that's really good. And um, it'd be good to get some feedback from people on what they thought and some questions because I'm sure this is um, some minds to think and uh, ask some deeper questions. It's probably, I wish this, you know, I could hear this conversation when, back when I was playing rugby. Like as a young person hearing this would have made a massive difference. Um, that's a long time ago. We're going back a couple of decades. But so really take this on. I reckon this is something, uh, sit down, if you've listened to it, sit down with a couple of your rugby mates and listen to it. Or if you've got a coach, uh, send this to them too, because I think they'd find this beneficial as well. So just share this with your mates that you're playing rugby with as well. Yeah, totally agree. So thanks for everyone tuning into another episode of Elite Rugby SNC podcast. Remember to like, subscribe, and rate Elite Rugby SNC on YouTube and Spotify, and follow us on Instagram. If you did like this episode, screenshot it, put it on your Instagram story, tag us in it, and we'll happily retag that as well because many people need to listen to this and we've provided some really good information. So also sign up to our newsletter and receive bonus free content each and every single week. So don't wait, make that good decision and join Elite Rugby SNC today and take your game to the next level. So thank you everyone for listening and thank you, Ben. Yeah, thank you, Kieran. Fantastic. Um, I'll let you go smash some Easter eggs there. <laughs> Thank you.